standards for this. And so between us, we sort of knocked out some standards for the sort of things that teachers should be doing and using this as an example to sensitize students to fraudulent claims. And if it's done that way, then, it, then that can be a real asset, I think. That, that's what you can do. <laughs> Um, you talked about the placebo effect, and um, the placebo effect is probably has a greater um, uh, a greater actual effect than often than the size of, of uh, the effect that a, that a drug or or some kind of therapy might have in and of itself. So, just wondering if some of the, these you know, alternative or, or complementary therapies that are out there could actually be addressing that and augmenting the sort of expectation effect, the the, the you know areas of, of, of physiology or, or, or psychology that, that, are, that have not been tapped into through conventional medicines in the past and that there is something that can really be offered even though they don't have necessarily a direct measurable physiological effect, especially with homeopathy, but even with some of the other ones as well. Uh, there's a lot that's not known about the placebo. There's something even more basic that isn't known. If you do a randomized trial and treat a, uh, and you have a placebo group and an active group, it doesn't matter whether it's homeopathy or herbal or anything else, um, you will get a lot of people recovering from the placebo group. But that doesn't mean there's a placebo effect necessarily. There is, uh, uh, there's no doubt, but it doesn't have to be that. My friend in the UK, Michael Bowen, who's a cancer surgeon, recently retired from UCLH, who's been very active in opposing Barminus from the Prince of Wales, who's a, who's a great advocate of talking to trees. <laughs> um, Michael tells a good story about that. He said, that I, when I was in um, Florence at a meeting, I had terrible backache and I couldn't get round the galleries, and I was very disappointed, and I was hobbling back across the square with a GP colleague, uh, one afternoon he said, Michael, you know, you're in a bad state, why don't you just give acupuncture a try? And he said, you know, the next day it was a miracle. I just walked around all the galleries and I, I, I was completely cured. And by the way, I didn't take up her offer. <laughs> 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 it's called regression to the mean. Francis Galton knew about it. If you take the pill when you're at your worst, there's only one, one way you can go, which is to get better. People, by and large, take their treatments at the time when they're in the most discomfort. Unless they're sort of turned deal, which most people aren't most of the time. The next day they feel better, they would do it if they were very bad at the time they took it. And they, 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 but of course the, the psychological pressure to believe that you got better because of the pill is, is enormous. I mean, I think even that's to it a bit. But um, usually of course it's not the pill, it's just that you're going to get better anyway. And that, I suspect most of alternative medicine is that, not the placebo effect at all. You know, echinacea makes your cold get better in seven days when otherwise it would have taken a week. <laughs> <laughs> How is it that you think that removing uh, homeopathic programs from universities will result in more scientific research? Oh, I don't think it will. Well, no. It will remove dishonesty from the universities. That's, uh, it, it's not going to produce any more scientific research in this. The, the, the amount of money they take must be a very small fraction of the university's budget, I imagine. It's not, it's not really a financial question, it's a moral question. Does, doesn't that satisfy you? <laughs> well, isn't it the university's job to lift this endarkenment? And, and then maybe if uh, these programs were there in the universities and funded, then you could settle the question once and for all and there would be no no uh, discrepancy between the people who believe in homeopathic medicine and the people that don't. Well, of course, these departments, if they were doing their job, would be doing that research. It says on the, the Yale side, for example, that they do, one of their justifications for existence is treating patients, the other is to do research in alternative medicine. So I emailed the, um, there's quite a young woman in charge of this, or she seems to have had a big role in setting it up. So I asked her to point out which of the bits of research that had been done in the Yale department had resulted in knowledge of a treatment which was effective, which had not previously been thought to be so. And I got a very gushing reply at first from her iPhone. 
but, it, but when she got home, I think she must have looked me up on Google because everything went silent for a while. But just the other day, I got a reply, and she said, I recommend that you look in Medline, and there was such and such. Nothing to do with the answer. The answer, of course, was zero. They hadn't done any research that produced a benefit with, from something which we had previously not known about. These departments simply don't do research of a sort which will give you the answers that are needed. And you have to decide for yourself whether that is because deep down they know their things don't work, or whether it's because they're just hopelessly non-research minded, don't know how to do it. I don't, I don't know which. My, my suspicion is though that deep down they know it's all woo. And, uh, and if they ever do a really good trial, they're out of a bit out of a job. That's the suspicion. Thank you for your uh, talk this evening. Since you uh, spent, uh, have begun spending much more of your efforts uh, as a pharmacologist on debunking alternative me uh, medicine, quackery, those sorts of things, have you found that any of your opinions about any of these alternative treatments, let's say, from the time that you were a pharmacologist until now, have any of your opinions changed at all? I suppose they haven't changed greatly because what changes your opinion is evidence. In this case, often that evidence would consist of a good clinical trial. And so, but you, you just don't find many good clinical trials in this area. Um, like I said, it's the, the meta-analyses of all the good homeopathic ones show no effect above placebo. The individualized herbal medicine trial showed three papers, two of which were uh, showed no effect, and one of which was ambiguous. You know. There's nothing there to change your mind, really. I think, um, I mean, your last point, there's nothing there to change your mind. I think what I'm hearing is that in a place, in a venue like this, the Center for Inquiry, where we should really be questioning, people in this audience should be questioning what you're talking about. I find it scary that I'm hearing almost a fundamentalist type of attitude that you have towards debunking non-alternative, uh, uh, sorry, debunking alternative forms of medicine when, and I should tell you that I am actually a physician, I practice allopathic medicine, I'm, uh, I also did an academic medicine fellowship at McMaster which is arguably the mecca of evidence-based medicine and I've worked with Dave Sackett himself a number of years ago before he went to Oxford, but I have found myself that I've become a better physician to be um, as I've gone as I've realized over time that there's so little that I know and that it's so important to be open-minded and to be able to ask questions and I don't hear many people in this room asking questions that are challenging you I mean you're you're preaching to the already converted so to speak um, if I were somebody who believed in alternative medicine and I've gone I've been helped by a chiropractor in the past um, I just, I don't have the answers. And yet I can tell you, yes, based on levels of evidence, there's not a lot of evidence out there for alternative medicine. But I think what's so beneficial about alternative medicine is that it provides a force that those practitioners of allopathic medicine have to answer to. In other words, they have raised the questions that have made us rethink our position. And in the past, when I was in this room many years ago and was told by pharmacologists or whatever in my medical courses, um, this and this, it was very didactic and we just absorbed the information. And at least now, over the last 10 years or so with the, the boom of the uh, World Wide Web, that quacks or alternative medicine practitioners or whatever, at least they are putting forward different points of view. And I think that the problem is, even your, the way your lecture is coming along, coming across, is that there's, no, there's not very much questioning. It's, you are just putting it out there. This is it. You're debunking this. It's, it's you know, wives' tales and all of that. And I think, well, there was a question at the beginning. And uh, I, would just, I would just think it's very important to be open-minded. Uh, uh, no, 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 this is great.
is what we need to a bit of opposition. I would like to know in, from you, I think you come back to the microphone, I, I, I would like to know from you in what way it is fundamentalist to say that, that I don't believe that homeopathy is works because they can't produce a, me a trial showing that it works. It, why is that a, a, a fundamentalist statement? That in and of itself is not a fundamentalist well, that's statement. That's all I was saying, Barry. <laughs> no, no, but absence of evidence does not equate to evidence of absence. That's number one. Number two, <laughs> number two, a fundamentalist, you said, I wanted to try to see if there's anything that could change your mind. And evidence if you're not being open, you're not being open. Evidence would change your mind. I changed it overnight if you produced the trial. That's thalidomide, the thalidomide in 1961. All right, as as a anti no no as an anti nausea medication was given to thousands and thousands of women. The problem was that the right question was not asked. The right clinical outcomes were not looked into. There were many other problems: randomization and not being double blinded. There are many many questions. Yeah, that, that you have this whole story wrong. Actually, I was I was around at the time of thalidomide, which is a major disaster. It happened. It was actually recommended largely as a sleeping thing. The reason that this, the effect wasn't spotted earlier was because it occurred in very few animal species, only in rabbits, which were later added to the amount of vivisection you had to do in order to get a drug approved. So the fact that it wasn't <laughs> spotted was not anybody's fault at the time. It just happened that rabbits weren't one of the species they were tested on, and it was very species specific. The only bit of crime in it involved was a small German company started it before it was taken over by the distillers company, were slow in, uh, in publicizing the first cases of, 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 of damage to, to babies, <coughs> heterogenesis. But, but uh, I, think, I think your country is actually quite wrong. There, there was a small amount of malpractice on the part of the company, mainly it was just a drastic accident. Look, I want to say overall that I, I agree and I think what you're doing is fantastic, even though it may not sound that way. I'm, I'm trying to raise questions here. That's what I'm trying to do. And I think that any attitude, be it didactic, um, everybody agreeing and supporting you, I don't think that's beneficial. I think, I think it, people should continue to ask questions. Oh, there are plenty of people asking questions. They're probably mostly not here, but <laughs> you, you, you try uh, going to a, a, any meeting of homeopaths or anything, and you get, you get a stack of questions. Um, but I, I, I cannot believe that it's fundamentalist to say that you will believe something when they produce the evidence and not otherwise. You say that uh, evidence of absence is not uh, um, evidence, what, what is it, you know, that usual saw that comes out. Um, that's quite true, it's about statistical power of tests. I'm sure it's a textbook on statistics, it's quite interesting. But, but um, of course, it's not a re if you just took that literally, you would just believe everything that came along. Um, said, well, there's no evidence that it's not true, so I'm going to believe it. There's a lovely saying by Robert Park, who is um, a sort of education person to the American Physical Society, that the last to inherit the mantle of Galileo, it is not sufficient to be persecuted, you must also be right. <laughs> The point is that balmy ideas are to a penny, but they're mostly just balmy, and one very occasionally one is right, and, and the stuff that come out at the end. Sorry. I have a bit of a diversion here from the pharmacology. Um, in the headline for this event, there was a mention of religion, and so uh, lately there's been uh, on the internet the most popular movie, apparently, uh, of, of the recent years on the internet called Zeitgeist, the movie. And I'm just curious if you've seen Zeitgeist. Um, and if you could comment on particular uh, the choices of the movie and where it uh, skeptically criticizes uh, to some degree and maybe conspiracy theorizes in another sense uh, the issues of the historicity of Jesus, then the 9-11 conspiracy, and then ultimately the uh, Federal Reserve conspiracy. And if anybody else has seen the movie, I'd love to talk to them at the, end of the, at the back of the room after this because it's... No, I haven't, I'm afraid, but I, I, I did hear about it, so it's on the list. <laughs> but, um, uh, yes, I, I, I rather doubt the more harebrained conspiracy theories. Cock-up is very much more common than conspiracy. 
they, they, they make nice stories, but probably not much more than that. The, the religion thing, though, is, is sort of weird because it's so restricted to the, uh, the United States. There's a strong correlation between religion and religious beliefs and the degree of education, negative correlation. <laughs> but uh, the United States is the exception, just as it is with homicide rates. The richer the country, the lower the homicide rate, except for one miles off the curve. The faintest idea why. It's, it's, it's a real puzzle, because most of the naive explanations don't work. It's, it's quite baffling. But they'll catch up in the end. I was amazed when the God delusion, which is also often accused of being a rant, just as I, they say, oh, well, Dawkins is just as much of a fundamentalist as the people he's opposing. Um, well, I, I, when I read the God delusion, I didn't think it was a rant at all. And he seems to be rather gentle and rather, um, rather well argued. After all, all he's saying is, no, I can't prove the, disprove the existence of God, and I can't disprove the existence of fairies at the bottom of the garden, and I give, give them about equal credence. <laughs> that, that doesn't seem to be terribly fundamental, it's just common sense, really. <laughs> Hi. Um, is that okay? <laughs> That's fine. Uh, okay. I've, uh, I've uh, found your uh, lecture interesting and um, in the spirit of inquiry and also uh, something that might be interesting to some people here is there's a gentleman by the name of Pomeranz here at this university. I believe he's retired now, but for about uh, 25 years he did research into acupuncture and apparently it was a very, uh, uh, very productive research. Have you, have you heard of the man? I haven't, no, but acupuncture is a good case. In fact, it was raised before, but we sort of got diverted. I got diverted. Um, there are two things that one can say about acupuncture. There's no doubt that sticking a needle in yourself produces a physiological response in right. your brain. I mean, that's been <laughs> part of sensory physiology for decades. Of course. Right. Uh, recently, uh, um, some acupuncturists came up very excited and said, look, this functional magnetic resonance imaging is so known as the brain is affected by acupuncture. Well, of course, it, of course, <laughs> you stick a needle in yourself, come on. <laughs> this is supposed to be some great breakthrough. Um, that's one thing. The other thing that there is very good evidence for is it doesn't make any difference where you put the needles. There's a whole load of mumbo jumbo surrounding acupuncture. It's called ancient wisdom, which usually means, of course, that it's wrong. <laughs> The, uh, and, the interesting and, and about meridians and energy flow and chi and all. Yeah, beyond the beyond that, I mean, there's complicated rules about where you must put the meanings, But when they put them in the wrong place, you get just the same effect. So all the background is almost certainly junk. The signal you get in your brain isn't junk. And what is quite ambiguous is whether this signal in the brain has any really beneficial effect on the patient. So in the short term, it will divert your attention from it. But that's that's not a a terribly dramatic uh, therapeutic effect of that is all it does. You want I mean, I obviously we can't really get into it now. Um, I think it's fairly easy to get in touch with you via email, so I'll just send you some references. But what I found interesting about his research is that he was able to demonstrate that points separate from the location of dermatomes or whatever seem to have very specific effects. And this is one major part of his research in that that kind of uh, goes a little bit further than what you're saying about sticking one anywhere can create an effect. So it's just an interesting thing. Um, but but the question... Dermatomes. The traditional stuff is to do with these imaginary meridians of right. Chinese folklore that have to do with dermatomes, which are perfectly uh, proper. Right, of course, of course. Norm. Yeah, I'm, I'm just uh, talking about this, uh, this guy's uh, research. The question I did have, though, is something that came to mind when you were talking about uh, corruption in science or whatnot, is uh, arthroscopic surgery. I'm, I'm sorry, there was a... I don't know how recent it was, but there was a study uh, comparing sham arthroscopy with uh, real arthroscopy. Yes, it is, and it's no good. Mm. Yeah. A, a lot do, of medical do, procedures are no good. Right, right. is no good. Yeah. Should be bad. So I was wondering about your, your opinion as to how, for example, how it was that arthroscopy got started and what, what allowed it to proceed for so long without... So that, that's kind of my question. Tested, yeah. Well, I mean, the consensus now is that tonsillectomy is a completely useless operation. It's right. Still millions of... A, 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 a year ago, I, I suppose that's the... Well, lack of evidence and perhaps a certain amount of conservatism on the part of surgeons right. uh, who've done it all their life and suddenly don't like being told that they've been wasting their time. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know, it's a complicated sociological thing, but things which don't work do take a long time to die out. But, but they do die out. When I, when I was in a pharmacy shop in 
1955 or something, God help us, a long time ago. Um, <laughs> they were selling tonics. Pre they were prescribing tonics. Bucket loads of the stuff, bottles of medicine, people bought it. <coughs> the very word tonic has vanished from conventional medicine altogether. I mean, it was a myth that you know, they never did any good for anything. Some of them contained small doses of strychnine. We sent him into a twitchy convulsion. Take a large dose, but it doesn't do any, any, anything in small doses to your mental condition. That whole class of drugs simply vanished because it didn't work. It's taken you know, 30 years for people to gradually realize. And check have, it out. have you noticed the trend in terms of how long for modern medical practice for these things to go? Is it 10 years, 20, 5? Well, I know. I, I mean, you're okay. I guess it's, it's, it's like a, it's like a generation, isn't it? No, if someone had done a good test on tonics, it would probably have been a lot faster. But no yeah. one got around to doing it. So okay. It, so it, it, but it's interesting that they faded out even without good tests. Right. They actually, eventually, just very slowly. Okay. Thank you. So I think we have time for two more quick questions. Um, well, someone sat down. Maybe one more then. I just have a quick question. I was wondering if you have an opinion on alternative diagnoses as opposed to treatment. So something like iridology that's not invasive, but apparently all your organs are connected to your iris and just by looking they can tell if you're susceptible to anything or anything like that. So. Oh yes, alternative diagnosis is big business. There's all sorts of food, food intolerance, for example. But, but that's been tested quite some time ago. If you go to lots of these people, lots of alternative people will offer all sorts of food intolerance tests or allergy tests. And lo and behold, you're sensitive to 25 different foods and all you've got to do is take these pills, which I'll sell you for £100 a month and they'll be, and you'll be better. It's a sort of means of running out of business. But it's very easy. One person has gone to 20 different practitioners and they all tell them that 20 different foods they're supposed to be intolerant to. They're mostly complete frauds and a means of running out of business. And they're, they're, they're quite common, and some of them, have, there's been some criticism of the thing called the York Test in the UK by the Advertising Standards Authority, which is one of, one of many such things. There's a thing called the Vega Machine as well. I, I, this is, this is I, I discovered what <coughs> was being used in the private clinic of a man called George Lewis, who actually is in Southampton University, um, complementary medicine department, he has a private clinic. This man publishes some superficially looking, um, good looking papers, research papers, one of which was to show that this Vega machine had no diagnostic value whatever. Then I discover by a sting letter to his private clinic that he's offering the Vega machine in his private clinic to patients. <laughs> so I'll put that on the web, he's really cross about that. Please, <laughs> All right, so yeah, we only had the room booked until nine, so I think we're out of time. But again, I wanted to thank all of you for coming out, and also Professor Cahoon for flying all the way here from the UK to this talk.